This one, actually, I would start with the New Testament reference and go backwards. This one, I would go to John chapter 12. All right? And so I would ask them, could we, could we look at the Gospel of John chapter 12? And I like to always set up a context for any verse I'm using. People always ask me, how is it you control conversations with these people? And I struggle with it. They're always interrupting me. We're always going different directions. I think one of the reasons is that when I talk about a text, I normally give its context. And they're not used to that. They're used to people just firing individual verses at them rather than saying, well, now here at John chapter 12, this is the end of Jesus' public ministry. And this is right before the, the private ministry to the disciples. And I think people go, oh, well, it looks like you've done more than just simply memorize some verses. You actually know what you're talking about here. It helps to give a context. And right at the end of Jesus' public ministry, verse 39, for this reason... They could not believe, for Isaiah said again, he has blinded their eyes and he hardened their heart so that they would not see with their eyes and perceive with their heart and be converted and I heal them. These things Isaiah said because he saw his glory and he spoke of him. Nevertheless, many even of the rulers believed in him, but because the Pharisees, they were not confessing him for fear that they would be put out of the synagogue. For they loved the approval of men rather than the approval of God. Now, we've all read that text a million times before. But had you ever stopped and asked yourself the question? These things Isaiah said because he saw his glory and he spoke of him. Now, the NIV will throw you a curve here, by the way, if you're using the NIV. The NIV follows a rule that basically says if you're using pronouns, and the antecedent proper noun has gotten too far back in the context. You repeat the noun. So does somebody have an NIV? Uh, was it, it says it, at verse um, 41, it says, These things Isaiah said because he saw Jesus' glory, right? Somebody with an NIV? Wow, I'm shocked there aren't any NIVs out there. Um, I think it says because they saw Jesus' glory. The problem is the... Uh, NWT, if they're using the NWT, they'll go, wait a minute, it doesn't say Jesus' glory. It says his glory, and they would be right. It's his glory. But the question is, who else is in the context? There's nobody but Jesus in the context. But you need to be aware of that if you're using the NIV at that point. It's not a literal translation. It literally says, these things Isaiah said because he saw his glory and he spoke of him. When did Isaiah see Jesus' glory? Well, we just had a quotation from the Old Testament in verse 40. What's the citation from? It's from Isaiah chapter 6. And hopefully you all know just by statement what Isaiah chapter 6 is. You should. Isaiah chapter 6 is the prophet's vision of Jehovah sitting upon his throne. In the year of King Uzziah's death, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, lofty and exalted, with a train of his robe filling the temple. Seraphim stood above him, each having six wings. With two he covered his face, with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called out to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is Yahweh of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the thresholds trembled the voice of him who called out, while the temple was filling with smoke. Then I said, Woe is me, for I am ruined, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts, Yahweh of hosts. The quotation from Isaiah 6 is verse 10. Render the hearts of this people insensitive, their ears dull and their eyes dim. Otherwise they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts and return and be healed. So do you see what John is saying in John chapter 12? When he says, Isaiah said these things because he saw his glory and he spoke of him. If you asked Isaiah, Isaiah, who did you see in Isaiah chapter 6? Isaiah's response would have been, Yahweh. Yahweh was sitting upon his throne, lofty and lifted up. But if you ask John, John, who did Isaiah see? John's answer is Jesus. The one sitting upon the throne was Jesus. Now, some of you, in fact, Paul saw my debate. Hi, Paul. Wave back. Paul saw my debate in, what was that, 2003 or 4? I forget which one it was now. 
with one of the leading then Jehovah's Witnesses, he's not a Jehovah's Witness any longer, uh, by the name of Greg Stafford. And when I wrote my book, The Forgotten Trinity, I read Stafford's work so that I could have the, the best attacks against my faith to respond to, to make my case the strongest. And in this context, it was in the context of responding to Stafford's arguments that I looked very carefully and I discovered that this identification of Jesus as Jehovah is a lot stronger than it appears at first look. What do I mean? What is the translation of the Old Testament that the New Testament writers are quoting? It's called the Greek Septuagint. Rarely do they quote from the Hebrew Old Testament. They almost always quote from the Greek Septuagint translation, the Greek version that their readers would have been using. And there's an interesting textual variant in Isaiah 6.1 in the Greek Septuagint. You notice what it said there? I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, lofty and exalted, with the train of his robe filling the temple. That's the Hebrew. Guess what the Greek Septuagint says there? And I saw his glory. The exact words quoted in John 12. John, knowing what his readers would be reading, made sure that they knew exactly what text he was referring to and exactly what point he was making. John identifies Jesus as Yahweh. At that point, a lot of my Jehovah's Witnesses start closing up their Bibles and their books and zipping up their book bags and getting ready for the door. But you know what's wonderful about all that is that once you show a Jehovah's Witness these things from the text of Scripture, I've never had a Jehovah's Witness leave his Bible behind. He may not take tracts from me. He may not take a book from me. But he always takes his Bible. And if you can show people in their Bible that what they've been taught is untrue. That'll always go with them. And that's something that the Holy Spirit can bless. So, why do I believe in the doctrine of the Trinity? Because I believe the Bible. Sure, the Council of Nicaea is important and all that stuff is important and I'm not, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with studying all of that. But the reason a Christian as a Trinitarian is because the Bible teaches those three foundational truths. And if you can get people into those texts, it's amazing what the Holy Spirit of God will do in witnessing of his truth. Thank you for holding out to the end. Let's pray and thank God for our day. Indeed, our Heavenly Father, our triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we thank you for your blessings upon us this day. We thank you for the strength to be here. We are reminded that there are many of our brothers and sisters in lands around this world that would have given anything to be with us here this day. And so we know we are privileged to whom much is given, much is required. May our memories be fertile. May you by your spirit write upon our hearts your truth. May you embolden us to be better witnesses of Christ. And may we seek truly to glorify you in this coming week of service and the coming months ahead. We thank you for this church that has the foresight and the desire to honor your truth, to know that your people must be prepared for the battle to which they have been called. And so, Father, we ask your blessings upon this church, upon the pastor, the staff, and all the difficulties and trials that life brings, that you would bring joy in the journey as well. We again thank you for this time and pray in Christ's name.